If you, let's take a look at um, at Oyster Creek. It was it was finished in 1969, which means it was started in 1960-62. And engineers in 1962 looked back over the historical record and determined what the what the worst hurricane was that could hit the area. Well, in the 55 years since this plant was designed, there's been a lot of global warming effects, and so suddenly now we're seeing a lot more energy in our storms than were anticipated when these plants were built 50 years ago. Um, the same thing at, at Fort Calhoun. Um, that was the plant that was completely surrounded, and my quote there was, sandbags and nuclear plants don't belong in the same sentence. That plant um, never anticipated uh, that uh, the, the Missouri River would be a mile wide. Um, and um, uh, it was only uh, because of a little bit of proactive work by the NRC, thank you NRC, two years before that, that forced them to um, increase their floodworthiness uh, that, that, that Fort Calhoun was able to weather that flood. You know, it's very rare that I pat the NRC on the back, but, but uh, that was one, Fort Calhoun. And I actually have a second one. The, um, uh, the NRC did something this week that, uh, that I'm proud of them for. Uh, this is uh, the NRC staff met with the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards down in Washington and recommended that all of these old boiling water reactors, the Mark I and Mark II designs, uh, have filtered hardened vents installed on their containment. And uh, the industry didn't want that, and I doubt the Nuclear Regulatory Commissioners want it, but the staff stood firm and um, uh, and pushed for something that uh, frankly surprised me that they were so adamant that it uh, a safety modification that needed to be made. What are containment vents? Well, the, the Mark I containment is this little inverted light bulb with a, a donut on the bottom. Um, and uh, it was too small. And people knew it was too small in the 70s. Now, I think they should all be shut down, and I'm on record that, that they should be. Um, but w when people realized that the Mark I and Mark II containments could overpressurize, um, the industry was able to convince the NRC that they shouldn't shut them down, but they could put a vent in the side of the containment. You know, if you're going to contain, you contain. If you're going to vent, you vent. But just don't call it a containment if you've got a hole in the side of it. Well, all of those vents failed at, at Fukushima Daiichi, and, the, and all the containments leaked, and and the unit one, two, and three all had explosions. So we know that filtered vents didn't work at Fukushima Daiichi, and um, uh, the, the NRC now was uh, is, is demanding something called a hardened filtered vent, which is a little bit stronger Band-Aid than the Band-Aid that's on these plants now. So then, Arnie, I assume there's a reason we're talking about containment venting right now. This is a lo this is a an old issue. This has been around as long as the Mark One BWRs have been around. Why are we talking about it now? Well, you know, the, 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 um, that, that the hearing was this week is, is, is obviously uh, awfully important. Um, and uh, I think the other piece of that is that uh, uh, here's uh, Oyster Creek was, was exactly that design. So we've got a, uh, uh, you know, a, a problem at a Mark I reactor just like Daiichi One. And um, uh, with, a, uh, with a, simultaneously a hearing in Washington on that same type reactor design. So it's a, it's a confluence of, uh, of events that uh, um, I, I just really felt like I owed it to the NRC staff uh, to thank them for standing up for hardened filtered vents. At least it's a stronger Band-Aid than the Band-Aid we had before. But it will cost industry. It's going to cost the, around 20 million bucks per plant. And if you remember the conversation we had last week, some of these plants are on the hairy edge of shutting down for economic reasons. So it's, uh, it could be the straw that breaks the camel's back and forces some of these plants to, um, to shut down because no one wants to spend another $20 million on a, um, on a 40 plus year old plant. And that's going to bring us, I, I suppose, to our next topic of conversation. The uh, Vogel plant in Georgia uh, is coming with a price tag. If you can talk about that. Yeah, the, the, last week we talked about how the Kiwani plant was, uh, was being shut down for economic reasons. Now, th this is a plant that was uh, 37 years old but had a license to run till 60 years old. And it only cost $200 million 
um, when it was bought in, uh, in, in 2005. And it was shut down by the company that owned it because they couldn't make any money. The nuclear plant staff and the fuel costs and all were much too high for the, the electric market that's out there now. Well, down in Georgia, they're building a, a two plants at, uh, at Vogel. And uh, those plants uh, are going to be pushing 15 billion by the time they're done in 2016. Um, they're claiming it might be 10 billion, but in fact, there will obviously be, be cost overruns. Now, um, t this week, there was a lawsuit between the people building the plant and the people owning the plant. And the, uh, the people building it say that the uh, cost is going to increase by almost a billion dollars, $900 million cost increase. Now, this plan is nowhere near done, so I'm sure there'll be more cost increases coming up. But a $900 million cost increase that they want the, the Vogel plant to absorb. Let me make sure I'm understanding this. We talked about the Kiwani plant that was a $200 million plant and it's being shut down for economic reasons. And this plant is $10 billion at minimum? Yeah, the cost increase at this plant is $900 million, which is you know, five times more than the Kiwani plant ever cost. And yet um, Kiwani shutting down and uh, Vogel is basically saying, damn, the torpedo's full speed ahead. Well, what's their plan to make money? Well, the, the Public Service Commission in Georgia is co-opted and, and, and uh, controlled by the, by the utilities that it's supposed to be regulating. And basically what they're doing is they're, they're guaranteed 11% return on their money. So they're going to pony up, uh, you know, let's say use $10 billion, but they're going to get 11% for the life of the plant. This is a good deal for the utility. Now, the bad deal is for the people in Georgia because uh, they're stuck with a plant that's going to have enormous costs and their rates are going to go up uh, enormously. Uh, the, the, um, the, the cost at the bus bar, which is where the electricity leaves these nuclear plants, will be two to three times more than other sources on the grid. So why is Georgia doing this? It's a, it's a great question, and I, I wish I had a good logical answer. Um, I don't have a logical answer. The, um, uh, the, the Public Utility Commission is not looking out for the people of Georgia, but instead is making a real lucrative deal with the people that are building the, uh, the Vogel reactor. It sounds like, to me, the owners of the Vogel reactor have a better financial situation than Fairwinds Energy Education. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> they'll spend more on lawyer's fees in a day than, um, than Fairwinds uh, uses in a year to keep this, uh, this site up and running. Um, which, dear viewers, I hope you can, uh, you can do something about. Um, uh, any contribution is great, f we're, we're grateful for. And, and every day when I walk to the mail and, and, and find a, a, a note and a check, I am forever grateful. Um, but we, we do need funds, and uh, if you haven't contributed, uh, uh, we, would, we would love to have contributions because, um, frankly, we have, uh, uh, we have bills to pay, servers to run, um, broadcasts to put up. And Maggie and I aren't pulling any money out of this, but uh, it does cost money to run the site. So let's think of uh, the Vogel plant and, and $900 million cost overruns. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll take uh, one-tenth of one percent <laughs> of that. <laughs> Last Last bit for this podcast, Arnie. We have a listener question uh, asking, uh, we have a listener writing us in. He's asking why when radio, radioactivity measurements are taken, why are we only seeing cesium being reported? Why not any of the other radioactive isotopes that we know are out there? Well, well the Fukushima Daiichi plant released hundreds of different isotopes. A lot have decayed away already. Um, but cesium is uh, particularly easy to find. Um, it, it gives off some very characteristic energy, and uh, you can say, oh, that particular decay was definitely cesium. So we measure cesium because it's easy to measure. That doesn't mean that the only thing out there is cesium. Uh, we know there's other isotopes, but they're much more difficult to measure. You know, cesium is a, is a muscle seeker, and you find it in, um, in the meat of a fish. Um, or the meat of a cow, for instance. 
Uh, but other isotopes like strontium are bone seekers and they're much more difficult to detect when they're in a fish or when they're in, in a cow because you've got to separate it out from the bone and, and uh, it's a very elaborate chemical procedure to, um, uh, to measure cesium, um, to measure strontium, strontium uh, right. in the environment. So uh, there, there are um, dozens of isotopes uh, still out there. Uh, when we talk about cesium, it's just because it's the easiest one to measure. Arnie, thanks for coming on today. I'm glad I could. This podcast has been a presentation of Fairwinds Energy Education. You can catch us back here next Sunday and every Sunday to keep current on what's happening in the world of nuclear news. 